Right, let's review the first two chapters. The longer we go with this, the more review is necessary, right? Because <laughs> it's a long time ago we talked about this stuff. Remember the very beginning of the Revelation, John is setting you up to understand what the Revelation is about. And the, the introductory language he uses is dripping with the language of his vision. He's already had the vision, he's introducing it now to write it down, and it's just pouring out of him. You, you can tell it affected him deeply because he's using the vision to write his introduction. So, uh, just wanted to point out, look at verse verses uh, 5 and 6 with me, because this is going to lead us tonight a little bit. Well, let's go to 4. The, the greeting here from John is includes grace and peace from a few different person, persons here. So, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Is that a theme? going to be, right? We're going to see that in chapter 4. It's awesome. From the seven spirits before his throne, talked about a few options. Who are they? Angelic <clears throat> beings, the Holy Spirit, what are we talking about? And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's obviously a big deal, that ruler of the kings of the earth. We've seen that. The faithful witness language is also repeated a lot. Now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood... And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, his God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That language right there is something we're going to see again tonight. That when he bought us, it wasn't just to get us out of hell and into heaven. He bought us so that he could turn us into a certain kind of people, to play a certain role in his kingdom. So notice in verse six, what did it say that he bought us to make us? to serve his God and Father. We're going to see how that ties in, in the book of Revelation, into reigning with him as well. Serving somehow <laughs> becomes reigning with God. It's pretty, pretty remarkable. Okay, so now remember in, in chapter 1, the, the vision begins with sound. That John on the island of Patmos on the day of the Lord is in the Holy Spirit, and he hears from behind this voice that tells him to write things down on a scroll. And he sends it to the seven churches. He lists the churches. And then he turns around, sees this person, <clears throat> falls over like he's dead pretty quick, but then thankfully remembers the details enough to write him down for us, what he saw. The details of the Jesus figure, whether it's Jesus himself or Jesus' angel, we talked about that. Either way, it, it demonstrates Jesus' glory. And the details there, ooh, I want to look at them again, they're so good. And then Jesus speaks again after he wakes up his friend John. He wakes him up and says that he needs to write down, now look at verse 19 here. Just remember, this is the outline of the revelation. Mm -hmm. Write therefore what you have seen, which might mean that vision he just had of him. What is now, which I'm thinking is chapters 2 and 3, what's going on in the churches? And what will take place later, which is what you're going to see in the vision follow. So, however it works, there's a there's a was and is and is to come, right? You see that? The one who was and is to come, write down what was and is and is to come. That's a huge, huge pattern here in the Revelation. So, in chapters 2 and 3, we see the letters to the seven churches. After we finish out Laodicea, I want to talk with you about one view and that's what the bigger packet you have is about. One view of how to interpret those seven letters differently than we have done together. I don't agree with it, but I want you to be aware of it because you'll probably hear about it if you look into Revelation. And I just want to give you a, a chance to look at it in a context where we can poke at it and challenge it a little bit and not just take it as at face value. Okay. So, we saw the letter to Ephesus. Was this letter... Uh, all positive, all negative, or a little of each? For, 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 which for Ephesus, the first letter. A little of each. A little of each. Good, good job, guys. Let's take care of this, guys. And remember, at the end of every message, Jesus makes a promise to those who conquer with him, or those who overcome. In Smyrna, would you say all positive, all negative, or a little of each? All positive. All positive. Good on you guys. Stick in there. You're going to suffer, but I'm going to take care of you. Chapter 3, or the third letter, I should say, is Pergamum. What do you think? A little of each, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and each church has different problems. A few of them have overlapping problems. And we see a few times the issue of the Nicolaitans and sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols comes up several times, right? How about in Thyatira? Okay. There are some severe threats going on here, like striking people dead. What? <laughs> this lady, uh, Jezebel, she's a she's a quite a figure in this letter. Um, how about Sardis? Uh, all, bad. all bad. Actually, that one's all bad. Not much going on here that he wants to praise. They're they're thinking things are going quite well, though. And probably other people do, too. It seems like their reputation with themselves and others is positive. They're alive. But he sees something else. We all are dead. Yeah, Sardis. Sure. Sardis, yeah. <laughs> so he needs them to take some steps. He gives them the steps they can take, too. Give, take, takes these steps so that we, you can come, come alive and we can restore this thing. And then Philadelphia. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, it's kind of refreshing after that Sardis letter. <laughs> it's a little woohoo, good stuff. And again, they're being persecuted. He says, "Hold on, I'll take care of you." And this one, he even promises, "I'll take care of you and keep you protected from the big test coming on the whole Roman Empire that's going to uh, test all the inhabitants, the known of the known world." And then now we reach Laodicea. What would you say about this one? Uh, negative. <laughs> negative, negative, negative. You, you're, you're not hot, you're not cold, both of which are useful, by the way. <clears throat> That's not, I wish you were all awful or all good. You're just a little of both. That's not what you're saying. You're saying, I wish I could do something with you. You're not helpful to me either, you know, in, in, any, in any way at all. So he threatens to vomit them out. He tells them that if you want to handle what is actually true of you, which is your wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, if you want to deal with that, come to me. I'm the source of the solution. You've got nowhere else to go. And, and remember, we, we looked a little bit at the irony of his language. Come to me to buy from me what you need when he's already told them they're destitute. <laughs> so, hey, beggars, come buy from me. What do you mean? I can't. And, and, and as I point, I, I think personally, that was his rabbinical way of making a point without having to say it. Because if you think about it for a few seconds, he's... He's being pretty clear, actually. Okay, then we talked last time about the fact that his love, Jesus' love for his people, requires him to rebuke and to discipline. That it's because of his deep love that he's saying these hard things. Because his only other option is just let them to their own selves and watch them die. <laughs> right? There's no way, as we just talked about in 2 Samuel, there's no way the Lord of the church can just look past the mess and pretend like everything's fine. So he has two options. He can either deal with the mess sternly to get their attention or just let it go and kill everybody. And that, obviously his love demands he, he do the hard thing. But the beautiful promise was if they'll open the door to him, He's already there knocking. Now, in other churches, when Jesus threatened to come, what did he threaten to come to do? Take the lampstand. One was to take a lampstand. What other threats did he make? Two. He said he would fight against them with the sword of his mouth. Mm -hmm. He said he would come at a time they didn't expect, but he never said quite what he would be doing there. He said he'll, he'll throw Jezebel in a bed, presumably of suffering. He would strike her children dead, right? Ooh, my goodness. So when Jesus talked about coming to a church, it was pretty consistently for judgment, punishment. In this case, he says, I'm already here, and I'm knocking on a door. This time, his presence was an offer. And, and it seems like what, uh, this is how I'm understanding it based on what he said in the other letters. It seemed like what he was saying is, I'm already here. My judgment could hit you. But you've got a moment here of my knocking. You've got a moment in my presence where we could actually have some sweet fellowship and restore this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So make up your mind real quick. <laughs> because if you don't open the door, my presence is probably going to mean judgment based on the other letters. Now, all of that said to Laodicea, Sweet, sweet offer by Jesus. He gives them one more incentive to open the door. And that is his promise to those who overcome. And as we've been looking at what, what does that mean to be the overcomer? 
or to be the victor or to be the conqueror. I don't think we can fully get it at this stage of the revelation. It's throughout the revelation coming that we're going to see what it looks like to overcome or to conquer. At this stage, he's making the promise to the conqueror, almost as if to say, now keep watching the movie and you'll see what I mean, you know, by that. But so far, based on just the letters, what do you think Jesus has in mind when he says to those who conquer or overcome or are victorious? Just based on the letters so far, what would that look like for them to to do any of those things? Well, you have to sit with him on the throne. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't mean the rewards of it. Oh. I mean, how would someone in their church sitting there listening, how would they try to figure out, am I one of those? Am I an overcomer? What would it look like for them to be that kind of person in that time? What is Jesus looking for when he's looking for an overcomer or a conqueror? In this world. Well, they would know, wouldn't they? But how? What, what would they look at themselves to see, I've got that quality that makes me the overcomer? You'd be Christ-like, for one thing. Okay. What does that look like? Like, how would I look at somebody and say, now that's a conqueror in Christ. You know, what are the qualities of that person? Or what does Christ-likeness look like? Big open question, sorry. I'm an open question guy. <laughs> it reveals me. Very much so. Very much a life that is dominated by the Spirit's presence and power and guidance. Correct? Walking in the Spirit is one way we put that. Right? Well, it says at the end of each one of them, you have ears left to hear what the Spirit says. Listening to the Spirit and, and obeying. Absolutely. Now, in the flow of the Revelation, and we've already seen it in chapters 2 and 3, there's a few characteristics that stand out. One is you endure hardship for Christ. And even though the world's making it really hard on you, persecution of any kind, really, but especially physical suffering, loss of the job. We talked about even guilds in that one city, that if you won't bow down and join them in their pagan worship, you could be out of a job and an income. A livelihood. And that's a part of this. Anyone who's willing to take take the hits and lose out and still follow Jesus, you're an overcomer. And we're going to see that really be fleshed out in the vision to come because it really ramps up the, the language to things like taking the mark of a beast. Where you could be killed if you don't take it. You can't buy or sell in the marketplace if you don't take it. The consequences are going to be really severe and you keep doing it anyway. So that's the sign of an overcomer. Also, the ones who do not follow the ways of the world in idol worship, in sexual immorality, in false teachers, you overcome. Because you saw the lie and you rejected it. So you conquered the lie that tried to steal you away. So there's a few things we've seen in the letters. And again, I think we're going to see that really take shape and, and flesh in the rest of the vision. So, at whatever level you understand the overcomer to be, I don't think we should leave it simply at someone who believes in Jesus. By that I mean, if you say, hey, is Jesus the Son of God? They're like, yeah. yeah. Did he die on the cross? You betcha. You know? <laughs> Did he come back from the dead? Oh, yeah, that's a great story. You know, I don't just mean that. I mean someone who trusts him, certainly. Because your trust in Jesus will define what do you do in any given moment. But if we're talking about someone who believes in Jesus like you believe in Santa Claus, that's not not what we're talking about. It, it looks like something in life. It's not a mental thing. Okay, so what so far, what are the promises that Jesus has made in these letters to those who conquer? And we have six, sometimes they're sets and sometimes they're individual. But what are the promises so far? No evil for the tree of life. All right. And where is that? There it is, God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, obviously, if you get to eat from the tree, you get access to paradise, too. Not bad. All right. What's the, what's the next promise? Will not be hurt at all by the second death. Nice. And after looking at what the second death is, I hope that promise means a whole lot to you. I hope that is a precious promise to you. 
Now, we had a long discussion about whether the second death is eternal and everlasting. Does it have an end point? Either way, thank you, Lord, for this promise. I don't want to be touched by it permanently or temporarily. Thank you, Lord. What's next? Hidden manna. Okay. The bread of sustenance. Oh. White stone with a new name on it. Now, those two go together, is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, same verse. Okay. I had fun looking into and talking about this one with you. Just because of, we, we don't know for sure what that's about. But, it, as I understand it, Jesus would be referring to that practice of the winner of the games receiving that little stone with the winner's name on it. That was your ticket into the banquet. Oh, there's a banquet coming. We know that. What else? Authority over the nations. All right. Now, this one is very much the sister promise to what we're going to look at tonight. So if you remember what we talked about, good. If not, okay, we're going to review. But that's a it's tremendous. And it's hard for, I think, most of us, the way we've been taught of things, this is a hard one for us to wrap our heads around. What does it even look like? And why me? <laughs> like a, number five, what do we got? Walk with Jesus and I'll be water on the of life. <clears throat> okay, so dressed in white, is that right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I'm betting the people in Laodicea, after hearing that he sees that they're truly naked, and then he says, "You need to buy from me." What kind of what kind of clothing did he say to buy from buy from him? In chapter three, verse eighteen, white clothes to wear. So they they hopefully when they're thinking back on the letters, they're like, "Oh, that's a beautiful promise," because we're naked. <laughs> he promised we'd have some white clothes that we overcome. So it's dressed in white. Name never blotted out from the book, right? Boy, that was an interesting conversation. If he promises not to blot it out, does that mean he does blot it out sometimes? Okay, and then what was the promise to the sixth church? Make a pillar in the temple. Of my God. All right. Pillar in God's temple. What else was involved with that one? Write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. And then, his name too, right? Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of names, new- was it the white stone that had a new name yeah. for that person? I don't want to leave that out. <laughs> no, only to the one who gets it. Ooh, whatever that means. Okay. Names written, so that's again, the New Jerusalem, God himself, and Jesus' new name. <clears throat> and then it, it had this phrase in there, and we had a little disagreement, that's fine, I don't, I don't mind that at all. But the, the statement of they will never again leave it, meaning the temple. And we were discussing, does that them or they refer to the overcomers, or the, the they in the actual language is singular, he, or was it God? It's, you know, that's up for debate. That's okay. But I'll just say, never leave temple. Either way, this is a sweet promise. Because if you're promising that Yahweh will never again leave his temple, especially the Jews would know why that's a wonderful promise. Because God had left the temple twice already. Mm-hmm. First, this, the first temple were before the Romans, or the Babylonians destroyed it. And then clearly he left the temple the second time because the Romans came and destroyed it. And if God's in his temple defending it, no one's going to be able to take it down. So what other conclusion can the Jews reach than if, if the Gentiles destroyed it, God must have vacated it? There's no way Rome killed God <laughs> or defeated God. So this idea that he'd never leave again would be pretty sweet. Or if he's saying the overcomer, who's the pillar, never has to leave. Also sweet, he's never getting ejected. You get to stay. Now we're going to talk about I'm going to need a lot of room for this one. We're going to talk about this seventh promise that goes along with this fourth one. Now, all of that, we we haven't even read the chapter yet. Okay, let's get to the chapter. All righty. 
Actually, I took so much time for review. Let's let's just read the chapter, the letter of Laodicea, and is someone willing to read that for us? That would be chapter three, fourteen. Okay, go ahead. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write: These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, that you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. <clears throat> I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and sad to put on your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit on me, sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father in his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Ooh, All right, so let's zoom on in to verse 21. And to the conquerors, not just the ones in Laodicea, right? To anyone. Anyone who conquers, he says, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Uh, I hope you're willing to just take a second and try to take that in. I like using all the <coughs> faculties of imagination you have. Are you picturing that? I... <laughs> First of all, I don't live in a kingdom where I even look on thrones anyway. I, thrones are just things I see in movies or pictures. Secondly, those are earthly thrones. What's the throne Jesus sits on? Oh my goodness. But then, you notice this, he, he gives us this in, interesting insight. If you overcome or conquer, you get to sit with me on my throne, just as... Now, I really like that he puts this in there. And, and I think there's a reason to this beyond filling space. Jesus is showing us how to view this vision coming. And the vision coming is going to deal with this thing, like just like all the others he's brought up. There is a huge connection between faithfulness in the face of persecution and, and the war that's going on and all that, the loss you'll have to endure, and the reward for staying faithful. So Jesus is saying, this is just a follow, following a pattern my Father's already put in place with me. This is not out of nowhere. This is continuing on God's vision for his whole kingdom that he's had in mind forever. He, he demonstrates it in his son, his unique son, Jesus, but he doesn't want it to stop there. He wants us, as Paul said in Romans 8.29, he wants us, God wants us to become like Jesus so that we are the first of many children. God's vision is centered on Jesus, but it flows from Jesus to all who belong to him. So the pattern is, Jesus conquered and so sat down with God on his throne. So anyone who conquers with Jesus will sit down with Jesus on his throne. The pattern carries on. Now, here's what's interesting. Before you get to the book of Revelation, do you ever, in the, in the, gospel, in the New Testament, do you ever have language about Jesus being seated on a throne? Yeah. And where is that pictured? Consistently through the New Testament, where is the throne Jesus sits on? It's the right hand of the Father. Right on. Now, here's, this is interesting to me. Throughout the New Testament picture, and these Christians would have heard about this, the message of the apostles and all that. If Jesus is said to be at the right hand of the Father, never is it said that I can think of where it said he's on God's throne. It's consistently said he's at God's right hand, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the language varies slightly, but it's usually this. Peter says the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Okay, that's God. That's fine. 
So interestingly here, it's at the right hand of God. He's always pictured at the right hand of God. Here, in the statement after this one, Jesus talks about sitting on the Father's throne. Then, spoiler alert, sorry, before we get there, we got to look at it. Chapter 5 <clears throat> follows, of course, chapter 4. And in chapter 4, we see God himself pictured on the throne, the central throne of heaven. Not the only throne, but the central one. There are other thrones surrounding it, but his is the throne, the great throne of heaven. And that's God on the throne. But then you get to chapter 5. And look at verse 1 with me, because you'll see some familiar language. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll. We'll get to that, what that means. But then look at verse 6. John says, he reports, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, meaning the throne he's been describing as the central throne, the throne of God. Hmm. The, the lamb is not on a throne to the right hand of the father's throne. In the vision, the lamb is shown at the center of the central throne. But wait, God was just on that throne in chapter 4. Now he sees the lamb on that throne. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that the rest of the New Testament got it wrong or that it's wrong in Revelation. What I'm trying to suggest is when Jesus says that he sat on his father's throne, that's representative of something. We don't have to take that as literally a location. What it represents, what does the throne represent anyway? Control, total charge. The yeah, the, so it's the authority. The leader, the authority. Yeah. yeah, it's not always location. The throne doesn't always represent where the king or queen is at the moment. It represents their authority to rule as king or queen. So when Jesus says that he was to sit down on his father's throne, what he's talking about is that he was to take the father's authority that the father was handing over to him. Now, is this consistent with what we see in the rest of the New Testament? How about in the Great Commission? Before he tells his apostles what to do, he tells them why they should do it. And never, never forget to link these two statements. Before he says, go and make disciples for me, he tells them, I have all authority on heaven and earth. But he doesn't just say that. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Even at that point, he was given authority by Father to sit on his throne. It would take about 40 days after his resurrection to go back to Father in heaven, but it had already been given to him to do so. God had already made the decision. Now, according to Jesus, here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, why did God the Father decide to have Jesus sit on his throne? He was victorious. <clears throat> because he conquered, he overcame. The warfare lingo is real there. He wasn't just running a race. That's a good metaphor for what he did too. But there was real warfare that Jesus faced in his mortal life and death. And even in death, he faced an enemy, death. And when Jesus faced all these enemies, he overcame them. He conquered them by staying true to Father. And so, as a result, not because of Jesus' identity as his only son, but because of Jesus' faithfulness as his only son, God said, take the throne. All authority is yours. Anything that I would do, you can do in my name. It's just like oh, that story of Joseph in Egypt is such a beautiful human earthly parallel to this. Because Pharaoh says to the entire nation, even those uh, members of his court that have been with him for however long, probably longer than that guy was alive, okay? He says to everybody, including his closest officials and confidants, this new guy that just showed up, Joseph, he is Pharaoh to you now. And the only one he's not in charge of is me. <laughs> now go to 1 Corinthians 15 because you're going to see an interesting parallel there. First Corinthians 15 is primarily about the resurrection. 
of Jesus and of all people. But he gives us an interesting glimpse into last things. So, 1 Corinthians 15, let's start looking at verse 23. Get this. Oh, this is so great. Speaking of resurrection, but each in turn, each will be resurrected in turn. Christ the first fruits. And we already saw that in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. He's the first. Okay. Christ the first fruits. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him will be resurrected. All right, that fits into what we've learned. Then the end will come, the end of the age. Where did I go? Where did I go? When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet, now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so God may be all in all. It's Pharaoh all over again. God said to Jesus, you're in charge of everything but me. <laughs> and God said to his universe, you see him, you see me. He's doing it for me. No difference, right? Oh, it's so good. So that's Jesus sitting on the throne of his father because he was faithful. Now, it doesn't end there. When Jesus calls people to himself, this is why I wish this was emphasized more. If we understand that our eternal future is not just to be in a nice place with all the people we love, but we understood our function and role is to actually rule wisely and competently with Jesus over everything, earth particularly. Because we already saw that Jesus is, where this was earlier in Revelation 3, in his introduction of himself to the Laodiceans, didn't he say, the ruler of all God's creation? Right? Now humans were made to be rulers of the earthly creation back in Genesis 1, correct? That was, that was the gig. Not just the Garden of Eden, the whole earth, all the creatures of it. When we talk about the return of Eden or restoration of Eden, one of the things that is almost never, in my experience now, I'm sure there are churches who do this well, but in my experience growing up in church, it was never emphasized that the return to Eden included the role of humans to rule. It was always about how it'll be perfect again. Yes. No more suffering, no more death. We'll have everything we need. We'll be back with each other that we love. But if you're going to restore everything to how it originally was meant to be, doesn't that have to include the role we play? And Jesus won't let go of that bone. He's tenaciously hanging on to the idea that if you conquer with me, you're going to sit down on my throne, the throne, the authority that Father gave me. So then... I wanted to give you this paper just so you can look at this. More. We don't, probably aren't going to go through all of this tonight. But on this single sheet, front and back, the verse we're studying tonight is, in high, is highlighted on the top of it. But I wanted to give you various glimpses throughout the New Testament where first Jesus and then we are pictured as reigning. I've got to tell you, since I've kind of gotten a whiff of this and have been looking into it and be beginning to embrace this as well as I'm able to, because I still have, like, wait a minute. In fact, I'll be honest with you, there was a, a very famous Bible teacher that would talk about reigning, and I always thought it sounded too much like health, wealth, prosperity stuff, like making too much of humans. Humans are just sinners saved by grace. We can't talk about this stuff. And then I started studying and realized, oh, <laughs> Actually, yes. That's a very appropriate language. Because here's the amazing power of the gospel and of grace. Grace doesn't just wipe up the sin mess. Grace is so powerful, it changes people that are that sinful to be noble, honorable rulers with God. Ooh, oh, man. To me, that doesn't exalt humans. That exalts God's grace. <laughs> you can pull that off with people like me. But anyways, there's a few verses I want to look at with you. 
just to drive home the point that our lives now are meant to be training for that time coming. Our ability to live faithfully to Christ now in his kingdom is going to have something to do with whether we're entrusted with that later. Um, just a, a few points of, of connection. You see in the middle of your front page, the John Revelation 4, mm-hmm. 4, 4. We're going to be looking at this more with more care a little later, but this we have to figure out what to do with this picture of 24 elders on 24 thrones in the throne room scene of God. And their thrones encircle God's throne. They're not in a different room. They're not shoved way over to the side. In order to see God, you had to look past them. They're in like the inner circle of God, along with these four weird creatures that we're going to talk about. And they're described in terms that sound human. I'm not saying they are. We're going to have to wrestle through that. But they're called elders. Now, we're going to call them elders. First of all, that's a very common term through Jewish and Christian writings about leaders of churches or of the synagogue or something. But also, would you really talk about angelic beings as elders? Because elder speaks of age, correct? Like young versus old and all that. As far as I understand the angelic realm, there's not like young ones and old ones. You know what I'm saying? Humans, that's true because of the generational cycles. But not so with angels. So there's there's clues here that this might be representing human rulers in God's ruling council, maybe. We'll talk about it. But that's just interesting. And then look at uh, Revelation 5.10. It's, on, <clears throat> it's paraphrased here, but let's actually look at it since we're so close. In Revelation 5.10, we'll back up to verse 9, actually. Uh, there is praise for the Lamb because he's the only one found worthy to open this scroll that was in God's hand. And apparently heaven was really anxious for someone to open it. Like, this was devastating that there was no one. And then he showed up as like, yoo we got somebody. So look at, their, look at their praise, their song to the Lamb because of this in verse 9. They sang a new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God Persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them. Now, are we just talking about Jews? Based on that, this is not just the Jewish people. (laughs) That would be understandable because they're his people, right? And it's not just the line of David. This is huge. This is broad. This is big. He says, you have made them, all those people, to be a kingdom and priests. We saw that earlier in chapter 1, to serve our God. But they throw this in now. And throw it in. They add this in them. And they will reign on the earth. Who will? These people purchased by Jesus from every tribe, language, and nation. The ones who are the kingdom and the priests. To serve God. Interesting that to serve God in this context means to rule. The idea of being a servant who rules should not be strange to the disciple of Jesus. Because what did he say? The greatest in my kingdom is the one who serves. Interesting. Right before saying they're going to reign on earth, it says they will serve God. And if the best way to, to reign in God's kingdom is to be a servant, that tells you that in this present life you're living, when you show a humble love for people so that you serve them, you're showing yourself a fit ruler in God's new world. Like, try to work that through, right? <laughs> and, and I love this because this, this has a lot to say about people in various lines of work that don't seem all that important. I think of people, and if you're in this or have people in this, don't feel offended. Uh, I've been in some of these myself. But I think of uh, when I used to work as a UPS truck loader, Dirty, tiring, thankless work. Oh, just repetitive and all. I'm shoving boxes in a large truck that's going to drive for a few hours and someone's going to undo all my work and unload it. And this job, if it weren't for the money, why am I here? And it's not a noble work, okay? I'm thinking of people who who wait on tables and deal with people's attitudes and 
and problems they have. Christina worked in retail, and I've heard it from so many retail people. You see the worst side of people when you're in retail. All these things where you really don't feel like you are honored in the world. I think of mothers who, <laughs> like my wife, stay at home and do thankless work that no one even knows they're doing, and it's like, what's the point? And I think of those who do what seems demeaning work or low work or whatever, who never get noticed or never get thanks, and if they're doing it with a heart of service and love, this is the upside down ways of God's kingdom. They're actually prime candidates to rule well. What? That's fantastic. I don't know. So this idea, we're going to see it more, more as we go, but this idea that those who serve God are actually fit to reign with and for God, I think that verse right there says quite a bit. You see also in Revelation 20, 4 and 6, this is going to be a very important conversation we have of how to interpret the thousand years that's here in chapter 20. But however you interpret it, whatever you think it means, literal or figurative, whatever, the fact that the there are a certain number of people who had been slain for Jesus, who had stayed faithful to Jesus, even when they meant their lives, that they were invited to rule with Jesus for those thousand years, whatever that means, that tells you a lot. Because again, what's with this theme of human beings reigning with God, with Christ his Son? Why does that keep coming up? Why is that so important? Um, in Revelation 22, 5, I put a, a note here just because I don't want to use this as a proof text and it not be true. But if you read 22, 5, let's do that. This is a picture of the new creation, especially the new city, Jerusalem, come down. Uh, let's back up to verse 3. So 22, verse 3. This is another case where the pronoun used is unclear. There's a few options for what the they might mean at the end of this paragraph. So starting in verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. Woo! Okay, well, the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And where is the city? On earth. On earth. <clears throat> Hello. Yeah, come on. There's no curse. The throne of God and the Lamb are now here on earth with us. Uh, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face. Yes. His name will be on their foreheads. Sweet. There will be no more night, at least in the city. Most people think that night's just not a reality anymore. We don't know that for sure. We do know in the city itself there's no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun. Why? God is looking at that light. He's so glorious. Oh, he, in the scriptures it says he lives in unapproachable light. That's how blindingly bright his glory is. But here, this is the, the line I wanted to consider with you. At the end of verse 5, and they will reign forever and ever. We've seen a few people represented here. First of all, they're the servants of God who are going to see his face, have, their, have his name on their foreheads. And we've also seen God and the Lamb. When you get to the end of verse 5, how do you read that? Do you read that to say that the servants of God who look on his face and have his name on their foreheads, that they will reign forever and ever? Or do you read that to say God and the Lamb will reign forever and ever? Or do you even want to take a stand on that one? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I'm a little thrown because it's a pronoun. It's a they. If you don't know who the they is talking about, the they doesn't help all that much. So I just wondered, maybe not at this moment, but before, if you were to have read this before, what would you have assumed the they meant when it says they will reign forever and ever? The servants. The servants. I think that's a very organic way to read it. Because the flow of the discussion about them starts in verse 3. The they of verse 4 is about them. 
And then it goes back to they in verse 5. So the they that's been used up till now has been the serpents. If someone wanted to argue that it's God and the Lamb, okay, I agree, they're going to reign forever and ever. But just, just from the organic reading of this, this to me, as I understand it, it's saying that the servants of God will reign forever and ever. You know who else is going to reign forever and ever? Jesus, according to the angel's message to Mary, his kingdom will never end. According to Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man who approaches the Ancient of Days will have a kingdom that never ends. So Jesus' kingdom will never end for sure. He'll reign forever and ever. And is there any reason to think that God's reign will end? No. <laughs> no, he's the one who is and was and is to come. He's locked in. So imagine a universe, and especially a new earth, where God and the Lamb reign forever. I've got no problems picturing that. That makes perfect sense. But also where they have an entire family of humans who have become like the, the unique son Jesus so that they're actually competent and trustworthy to reign alongside. Now, I also think there will be angelic beings who have rule and dominion maybe over heaven. I don't know about all that stuff, but that makes sense because it seems to be true now that that's, that's going on. But in terms of the planet Earth, humans, from all of the indications... Rain. Now that's not all. Keep looking with me on this paper. If you look in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3, in discussing why Christians should not take each other to worldly court to get issues resolved, Paul tries to gently shame them by reminding them. He says, don't you know? As if they should have already known that. He says they are going that. Christ's people are going to judge the world and they're going to judge angels. And judgment and rule usually are hand in hand in the ancient context. I'm not talking about a jury. That's a very new thing in terms of world, you know, common usage in the world. The Greeks had a little bit of that. But in terms of worldwide understanding that making a judgment, you could just be somebody off the street who's chosen. No, it's rulers who make judgments, correct? In the most of human history. So if Paul's talking about judging, it has to mean there's authority to rule in some way. And he says that we're going to judge the world and judge angels. And his point is, so why can't you guys figure out these small issues in your church? Seriously. Get your act together. <laughs> now, here's what I'm, this is one reason I'm saying the idea that we're going to reign in the future should not just be something about then. It should entirely affect how we live now. And Paul seemed to think so. Because he thought, it's embarrassing that you're destined to rule someday and you can't even figure out the small stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, guys, be wise enough to handle this stuff because you got bigger stuff coming. <laughs> so get ready. Act like it. Train like it. I love that Paul put that in there. And it's just this small little blip. You move right on past it. But I think it, it holds a lot of weight. You're going to rule the world and angels. So figure out how to settle these little things, guys. And then there's a few parables Jesus tells that gives you this idea that faithful service to him now will mean great honor over his domain later. Matthew 25, you see it here. Luke 12 has a parallel to that. In Matthew 25, you're familiar with it, I'm sure. When the master goes away, he leaves five and two and one bags of gold. And the guy with five doubles it. When the master comes back, what's his reaction? Well done, good and faithful servant. I put you in charge of a little. Now I'm going to entrust you with much. Come and share your master's happiness. The guy with two doubled it. Master had the same race, same exact reaction. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful a little. I'm going to put you in charge of much. Come share your master's happiness. There's that yacht who dug a hole and stuck it in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> what was the master's reaction to that guy? <laughs> it wasn't just you. He kicks him out. He's gone. He doesn't have a place here at all. It wasn't like, you'll do better next time or else. It was like, nope, you're done. <laughs> I don't want to focus on that at the moment. We'll get to that another time. But look, look at Luke 12, 44. Jesus says that the, the servant who's faithful at the work he was given when the master left, when the master comes back and finds him doing it, Jesus puts it this way. He'll put him in charge of all his possessions. 
Now, that can't be true of every single Christian. We're going to be divvied out a share of that. But the point is, you took care of the thing I told you to do. I now know I can trust you with whatever I give you. So here, you know, go for it. And then, similarly, in Luke 19, Jesus tells basically the same story as in Matthew 25. But rather than saying generic or generally, I'll put you in charge of much, he gives specifics. Now, in this story, the man who went away didn't just go away and do something and come back. Jesus specifically says he's, he goes away and is crowned king of the country. He comes back and finds his faithful servants or his unfaithful servant. Now, for the faithful servants, Jesus says the king, the newly appointed king, comes back and says, hey, you were faithful with the little bit I gave you. You take charge of those ten cities. Because I'm king. I can put anyone in charge of those cities I want. And the next guy, he says, uh, hey, you did good with this. I want you to take charge of those five cities over there. I'm, I'm in charge. I can put anyone I want in charge of those five cities. Now, am I saying that this is not a literal telling of what's going to happen in the future? No, it's a parable. But I can't help but connect it to Revelation when there's a whole new world and there are going to be cities and there are going to be civil civilizations going to be there and someone's going to be in charge of something, right? Pretty, pretty phenomenal. Pretty awesome. And then in 2 Timothy 2.12, it's a one-liner, but oh, if, I don't know, honest with you, you're going to look through the scriptures, hopefully, as we go through Revelation, and you're going to find other scriptures, Old and New Testament, where you're like, that's a great summary of Revelation. This is a great summary of Revelation. Look at for 2 Timothy 2.12. I actually put the quote on this page, just because it's <laughs> short and it's, it's <laughs> profound. If we endure with Jesus... And isn't that revelation? Suffering, being an outcast, losing out, being the minority, the weirdos, people celebrating your death. You know, if you endure with Jesus, everything that comes because of him, we will also reign with him. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't pretend like it's not in the Bible. It's too clear. I mean, this is not, I wonder what that means in the Greek. I looked it up. It means that. It really does. <laughs> the word reign means the reign of kings and governors. It's reign. And what Jesus says here is so clearly attested to elsewhere. This should not have been a surprise to them when they heard it. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us when we hear it. Though it should probably boggle us a little bit. I'll be honest with you. Because I still am like, me? Really? But that's a pretty brand new creation you got there. You want to handle it for a while? He's <laughs> like, no, I'm going to train you. You're going to be ready. You can take it. Why? Because you proved yourself to me. I saw what you did. I so want for us, and I'm talking to myself too here, I want us to live lives where everything matters. Every small little action is fueled by love and faith and, and worship so that when Father is evaluating us and Specifically, the Lord Jesus is evaluating us to determine our role in this new world. He's not just flipping through the big stuff. Hey, you gave your kidney to somebody. Not just that stuff, but I, and Jesus used language like this. I saw you give that cold cup of water to somebody that day. Didn't Jesus say that? Yeah. Even if you give a cold cup of water to this little child. I saw you hand that, that Kleenex to that person you're talking to when they started tearing up. They didn't even ask for it. You just handed it to them. I see that stuff. And I see you serving and loving. I see how you, you are giving of yourself and not looking to gain for yourself. That's exactly the kind of person I need to rule my own world. Think about this. If God's smart, obviously he is, he's going, to, he's going to appoint people to rule in his new world who are going to maintain its goodness. And you, you've lived in a long world enough like I have to see that when bad leaders are put in place, it wrecks the joint. When people are there for their own pride, their own esteem, their own money, they're laundering or they're cheating on their wife or their secretary, they're abusing their power for their selfish ends, it ruins everything. So, of course, if God's going to populate his kingdom with righteous people and put people in charge of those righteous people, if he wants it to maintain righteousness, he's got to have people in charge who are selfless who want only what's good for the people they're leading. Thus, the greatest in my kingdom is the one who serves. So there's so much here that I hope encourages you, that motivates you. And I'll be honest, this is one of the things that should help us see worldly stuff in black and white terms. That I, 
Even if it's not evil, I don't need to waste my time on this stuff. It's what we looked at in, in Hebrews 12. Throw off everything that so easily entangles and run the race. Get rid of the stuff that's holding you back. We got training to do. We got a world to rule someday. And I don't know if you've seen the movies and stuff, but whenever there's a story where there's a king with a young son or daughter and Lion King, come on, Lion King, and he's taken, I'm going to go with Lion King because I love it. So um, Mufasa takes his little, um, you know, after they hold up the little baby cup, you fast forward and Simba's grown up a little bit. He's not an adult, but he's smart enough to figure some stuff out now. And you see in the the story, Mufasa's taking Simba on a tour of the kingdom. Takes him up to a high place. You see, as, as far as the light the light is, until that shadow, that's the stretch of our kingdom. He's training his son to rule. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to keep talking because it gets sad after that. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, our, father, no, our, father, <laughs> our father will not get trampled by wilderness. <laughs> um, but, so, so as you're a disciple of Jesus, I would love for you to understand that picture. That your, your master Jesus is not just trying to keep you away from all that bad stuff. He's actually showing you, this is what my kingdom looks like. Here's what ruling it looks like. I want you to get ready. And so, of course, I'm not going to waste my time and sully myself on things of the enemy's kingdom. I'm not going to go into the jackals or the hyenas lair. That's not what we do. I'm learning from the king how to be a king or a queen. I just... I can't get enough of this. This is amazing. Yeah. It really sets the tone of your whole life with Jesus. And well, what does like where does like today? Let's just say, but where does when you're thinking about things from your path, like regret, where does that fit in? Like, how does that fit in when you say you regret that doing something? I mean, it's like you don't want to say I'm, I'm forgiven for not doing it, or was it? But you regret that you did something, or something happened and you regret it happened. Like, where does that come in to play? Like regret. Yeah, I think that actually demonstrates that your training is working. Because if you can look back at something that at the moment, back back then when you did it, at the moment it seemed so right. Like, I, I just need to do this. <laughs> and you fast forward the tape where you've matured, you've learned, you understand reality better now, and you look back and go, what was that? Yeah. What it is, it's, it's living proof. You are living proof that Jesus' training works. And that I'm, I'm stepping towards the kingdom and away from that foolishness. And it's, that's why those pictures, not always of lions, humans work well too. But any picture that you can get of a monarch training up their children to rule with them, you see that those children are immature at some point. They are. They're, they're being taught how to be proper at the table and, you know, and they're picking their nose and stuff. Well... By the time they're old enough to understand picking your nose is really doofy at the table, you, you're not holding on to that anymore because you're saying to yourself, well, that was me at 12. Of course, I was a doof, but now I get it. Thank you, Father, for teaching me that. And I think for the Christian, our freedom from guilt and, and shame from our past things is that we get to joyfully say, look what you did, Father. Like, I get it now. And, and the language of regret, I think, is perfect. Mm-hmm. because I did waste that chance. I did damage those people. I did solely your name. That was awful. But I don't have to live back there because he killed it. You know, that's the old me. That's the dead me. And why should I carry baggage from a dead guy? <laughs> I left him in the water. He's, he's gone. You know, people, you know, a lot of people do things and they know when they regret. <laughs> Robbie, in order to regret something, you have to have learned that was wrong. Right. Or you yeah. don't regret it. Right. So if you have regrets, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. You've changed, done it differently. Mm-hmm. So the regrets you have are good because you, you know that you've been shown that that was wrong. Mm-hmm. And you're and sorry. Then, and you're sorry. What you do? Right? I have. I'm glad you We all do. We all do. Yeah. 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 your life that you just don't. You know, you should probably reach out to, and then you don't, and something happens, you regret that. Cool. You know, like just things, and you're so obviously your know. past. There's some things in your past that you're going to just go, oh, wait, you know. Well, what's your biggest regret? Then you will tie it in. Look at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, you know how you, know, you just think no, about that's, stuff. No, that's excellent. 
Yeah. Well, by the way, things come to perspective when things are happening in your life that aren't always the best things. This right. this so, can help you in that. It has, this has helped me because when I go to Father with these things, this has changed. This whole concept has changed how I talk to him about some of these things because before it was good. It was I understand that I broke your word. I dishonored you. I hurt those people. I'm so sorry. That's still there. That's still very much part of it. But I can also say, and I know that I am meant for much greater things than that. that you've got more for me than that. I'm so sorry that I'm not living up. And it's not like boo-hoo owes me. It's, but I so want that, Father. I want that greater thing you have in store for me. So help me throw off this stuff that's holding me back. Help me, Father. I need your help. Because at this moment, I'm still dust. You know, I'm still this... The, the statement of Jesus to the disciples, maybe this is a good one, let's do that. When, when Jesus was praying in the garden, and he had a simple request for his best friends, say, mm-hmm. like, just stay and wake and pray with me. We've done that with each other. Mm-hmm. Like, this is not super heroic stuff he's asking for. They fall asleep on. These are men, by the way, it's on here, on the front page. Uh, did I put it on here? Yeah, in the very first reference, Matthew 19, 28, and Luke 22, 30. Jesus had already told these guys, you're going to sit on 12 thrones and rule Israel. You're going to judge Israel when I when I take my throne. He'd already said that to these men. Now, he goes to these men who are going to rule Israel <laughs> with him. What? <laughs> Regret. Come on, man. <laughs> but here's the thing. He doesn't say... Boy, that was a bonehead move on my part. I should go choose 12 other guys. What he says is, and he's so kind. Oh, I love him for this. He says, the spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. He doesn't hammer them for it. I mean, he's upset, and he makes that known. But he doesn't He doesn't rip them apart. He, he acknowledges there's something about you right now that we're going to have to overcome. Your flesh is weak. But he saw their spirit. And when he said, pray with me, they're like, you betcha, Lord. You betcha. You, <laughs> you know, and it's Peter. When, when Jesus, is, Jesus says, you're all going to abandon me. Peter's like, no, no, no. I'll die with you. I'll die for you. And Jesus saw his inner heart and he knew, I know you want to, buddy. I know you want to. You're not going to. You're going to blow it big time. Three times, actually. But, but Jesus saw that in his heart. That's what he wanted to do. And if you can, you'll hear those words, I'm sure, echo in your mind and heart. When you come to Father with your regrets and your sins and your repentance, you'll hear his loving voice saying, flesh is weak, but I see your willing spirit. I can work with that. That's, that's good. Mm-hmm. Remember those, those apostles asleep in the, in the garden? Yeah. And you know, I saw them Saturday. Kind of boost you. Yeah. yeah. They were. They were. They were. They were. Right? <laughs> These are the great rulers of the nation. Yeah. They can't stay away with Jesus and his empowered. Well, I don't think, you know, I'm just sitting there thinking about this. Um, if you own a company and uh, you were going to appoint somebody as the president of your company or the leader of your company, you would want to find someone who did the right thing when nobody was looking. Yeah, that's what you'd be looking for. And I think, I think for us, we have to ask ourselves: Do we do the right thing when nobody's looking? Yeah, integrity. Mm-hmm. You know, because everybody has a tendency to want to get a pat on the back, to be a proud, a pride, a pride thing. Mm-hmm. But how many people? How many people really do the right thing when, when nobody's looking? You're right. I would. I, I love work. work. Thank you for saying that. Let's let's go to Colossians. Oh, this is going to tickle your fancy. <laughs> Remember that the Roman Empire was populated by just massive number of slaves. Now we have to think of slavery different in the Roman Empire than in American history. Because there were slaves of all different levels of education, of all different ethnicities, of all different situations. And slaves at that time, they were property, but they could make money, they could buy their own freedom. It was a very different situation than an American slavery situation. But they were still not free. They still belonged to somebody. They still didn't have their own control over their own life. And and I just, before I read this, I just, I want you to think, if you were a slave in the first century, which many of the church were, the church was actually criticized because they're full of women, poor people, and slaves. (laughs) 
that's what that's the best you guys can recruit or poor women slaves. And that was actually a badge of honor for the church because that's who Jesus said to go. Go for the poor. The poor need this. Right? So think on what it would be like for them to hear this. And I wonder if the leader of the church in Laodicea and the other churches had to convince the slaves, listen guys, this is you too. You guys are being, it's not to the conquerors who have been free people, I'll, I'll let you sit on my throne. Every person of every stage and category, you know, the women of that time, and of our time, but the women of that time who were so held down, you can't get an education, you can't do these things. Mm -hmm. Jesus never said, hey, you male conquerors, this is for everybody, right? Well, but then listen, and this is what Bill's words reminded me of. This is Colossians 3. Verse 22. Keep in mind what Bill just said as we read this. I have no doubt this is something that, that Paul must have considered. The future reign of God's people when he wrote this to the slaves. Colossians 3.22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, the Lord, not for a human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Not just when their eyes on you. That's what, that's what it made me think of when you said that book. When, if the master never recognizes that you did that good thing, your master recognizes that you did that good thing, right? And that's just giving him more reasons to hand you over a greater inheritance because he can trust you with it. Woo okay. Now, we don't have enough time to do this, but I want to try. So let's go, over to the, <laughs> let's go over to the big packet. If you were thinking of saying something about that, go ahead, though. I don't want to cut anybody off. That, that first topic. One reason I gave this to you is so that if we don't get a lot of time to discuss it, you can take it home and look at it. But I wanted to give you the highlights of this whole view of the letters of chapters 2 and 3. Partly for your awareness, partly so that I can <coughs> warn you against a few of its elements, because I don't agree with this. But, again, if you, ever, if you look at Revelation in very many sources, you're going to see this come up. This is not an uncommon way to view the letters of Revelation. So, one view of Revelation is uh, actually one of the more popular ones. It's the one that infuses the books, uh, the Left Behind books, that are really popular. It kind of took the Christian world by storm whenever that was, was it 10, 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. A lot of those books. And they were written from this point of view that, that I'll be talking about. In fact, the man who wrote that book, I was reading his commentary about Revelation, he was talking about this very thing. So this view, this is just one person's take on it. There are a lot of different takes on this same view, but Clarence Larkin is the one who put this whole thing together. I thought he described the, view, the viewpoint pretty well and gave some good information. So here's the general point. What he would say, and a lot of them would say, hey, go to Revelation 4 with me, chapter, one, chapter 4, verse 1. I want to show you something that is one reason I don't like this view. <laughs> I'll just start out the gate with it. Because a lot of what they say hinges on this interpretation. Okay, after the letters, chapters 2 and 3, you get to chapter 4, verse 1. The, the vision continues now, or actually it starts. Up till now, it hasn't really been a vision. It's been dictation of letters, right? Now a vision actually commences. And in chapter 4, verse 1, which God willing will start next time, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had heard first speaking to me, like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. <clears throat> now, in this view, that statement right there is considered the rapture of all believers. That is a picture of every believer being called up here into heaven. Hmm. Now, a simple reading, what do you get from this? Who is called up there? John. 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 Simple reading. Yeah, All right. You have to have already have something in your brain going on about the church being raptured to read verse 1 of chapter 4 and go like, oh, there's the church getting raptured. You don't get it from reading this, but I can see why you might see it in there if you're already prone to see it in there. Now, the, the case that they would make is the church has to be raptured out 
at the beginning of chapter 4 because you never see the church again until chapter 19 when Jesus comes back with his holy ones. I strongly disagree with that, and I actually did my research throughout the book of Revelation to find places where the believers and the servants of God are on earth through this vision. But that's their claim. And you know what they're saying? The word church never shows up again. That is correct. The word church is not found after chapter 3. But to therefore say that the church is in, exi is in, ex in, in existence in the story ignores that you can refer to the church in various ways. Do you hear that? <laughs> the saints, the holy ones, the servants of God. There's lots of ways to talk about the church without using that word. So here's what they would say. This guy especially. Not everyone would say it this way. But based on the, based on the language of Jesus to John, that you've got the things that were, the things that are now, and the things that will be, or the things that are to come. The things that were are the, is that first chapter. The things that are now are the letters. Now we've talked about that. That's right. At the time of John, those are the things that were going on. But here's where this viewpoint is different. They say, this is the are now of the current church age. The time of Jesus starting the church to the time the church is raptured out, they believe that chapters 2 and 3 represent the entire church age. And once you get to chapter 4, you're going to be looking at the last days of tribulation and stuff like that. So what, what I was saying is I think this is correct. Chapters 2 and 3 are the R now for John right. at the end of the first century. They're saying, nope. It is the R now of the whole church experience through the two millennia so far and until Jesus comes back. So here's, here's the, the real punchline. Go back to chapter uh, 2 in the letter of Ephesus. And I'm going to give you in five minutes a real quick work on this. And I, I just want to show you why I think there's, there's of course, a rationale to this. People are crazy who think this, but I think it's it's er erroneous, and I think it has a few dangers to it. So in chapter chapter two, first first letter, Ephesus. If you look at the message of Jesus to Ephesus, they would say that the description that Jesus has for the Ephesus problems and and good things, it describes the early church. And the guy who wrote this packet would say, it goes from, that in your packet, turn to, oh, it's not numbered. It's basically page four. It's got the big graphic on the top. Yeah. So as you can see at the bottom of that section about Ephesus, it says this is the time period from AD 70 to AD 17. So they're saying the letter of Ephesus was really to a real church at that time, but as God is giving a prophecy to John, it's actually a prophetic letter about the whole church in this time frame. And you can read what he says about what the way that that letter characterizes that the whole church during this time frame, the early church. Okay. And then the second letter to Smyrna he says, if you look at the issues that Smyrna had, remember, Smyrna is a church with all good, correct? Mm -hmm. No, no criticisms. Mm -hmm. But they had this issue of uh, being persecuted for the ten days, and so this is supposed to represent the church from 170 to 312, and it says those ten days either represent the ten great persecutions against the church under Rome during that time, or the last ten years of this terrible time of persecution at the end of Diocletian's reign. So that even the detail of 10 days in prison represents some bigger thing in the church's history. During the <coughs> you can go on down the line, and, and there's a, a chunk of years in the church's history that goes with each church. Now, if that's true, I only got like two minutes left, so I'm going to give up on that. But you can do this for yourself with the packet I gave you. If that's true, what would you guess they would say what church letter represents the current church age, the current church period now? Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Not Philadelphia. 
They would assume we're in the last stage of this whole thing because it's the last, you know, we're getting there, close. And the church in Laodicea is known to be that lukewarm church. Mm -hmm. And Jesus comes and says, I'm here, I'm going to knock on the door, I'm in. And they would say that represents the church today. Now, is anyone going to disagree that the church has some major problems with being lukewarm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. I don't disagree at all. Yeah. You, know, you, you, talk, you talk about uh, this is what it was and this is, uh, this is where it's going. And they're saying that uh, up, to, up to the last church is today. But that's a, that's a moving target. You're exactly it's correct. moving target because today is today. Tomorrow will be a new today. So, and, and people have been reading these words for a long time, so that, that, that just kept moving. Yep. Today, just, you know, just keeps moving. So, what is today? Is yeah. Today, uh, today? Is it tomorrow? Was it yesterday? <laughs> 10 years ago? 50 years ago? What? Yeah, and how can we be sure we moved into Laodicea and we're not still in Philadelphia? Yeah, How can we really be sure that there's not a worse lukewarmness coming or something like that? So the subjective nature of it is one of my difficulties. It is very subjective. There, all you can do is look at church history, look at the letters and say, mm, yeah, that goes there. And in fact, this is one reason why if you look at somebody else who believes this, their years will probably be different. The, the chunk of time they put on each letter will probably change because it's subjective. They're going to say, uh, I think the persecution has lasted 10 years before this, or whatever. I don't know. I don't look at all of their stuff. But here's another problem. The later you get into this, the church spreads worldwide, right? The church reaches the nations. In order for this whole thing to work, you have to focus on the Western church. <laughs> in Europe. Because they'll talk about the Pope, they'll talk about the, uh, the issues that come up with the Pope and all this stuff, the Reformation. They'll talk about all those things and guess where all that stuff is happening? In Europe. Where the white people who run all that stuff have their tradition and have their history focus. Well, what about what's happening in Africa during those times? Well, what's happening in Asia during those times? Well... <laughs> Do you see, that's a problem. Because the people reading this in Africa and in Asia, if this interpretation is correct, they've got to go learn about European history for this to make any sense, for this to apply. So now, do they have a different set of seven for Africa? And there's a different set of seven for Asia? No, that's, that's weird to me. It's just strange. The other, one of the other problems with this is they claim, I'm, not all of them, I don't know, but the ones that I read, they claimed if you read the letters themselves, there are things going on in the letters that could not be true for that church. Therefore, it must be speaking of an, another time. Thus, it has to be prophetic. We've looked at all seven letters by now. Is there anything in any of the letters that you look at and go, that doesn't fit the first century? No. I don't know what they're talking about. I didn't see anything in there that I'm like, hmm, that's talking about the year 2000 and not the first century. There's nothing there that doesn't fit there, in my estimation, in my opinion, having studied. And I've looked at a lot of scholars, I've looked at a lot of commentaries that don't hold to this, and they don't see any problems in it either. So I just don't know where they're, where they're coming from. One more thing I'll say about it. And again, if you do believe this, I'm not trying to beat up on you. But I just want to, I want to give you a few defensive things against this, if you read it and you're like, oh, well, that sounds like an airtight argument, just so you know there's a lot of holes. Here's another one. And this is a tendency that is, to me, just so distracting and unfortunate. I love my brothers and sisters who do it. I just think it's spinning wheels you don't have to spin. I was looking at several commentaries that follow this track, and what they do is they take the name of the city, Ephesus, Smyrna, and all this, and they say, here's what that name means. And that's how it connects to the letter. And that's how the letter connects to what happens in church history. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't find that when I studied. So I went and looked at where did they get that Ephesus means this and Smyrna means that. And I found out that is really debatable. And so here's the tendency I want to just warn you against. When you're reading a book like Revelation, which is so symbolic, so mysterious, there are Bible teachers out there, and I love them, God loves them. But they want to turn every detail into something. 
The name of Ephesus does not have to have a meaning that applies to the letter. It just doesn't. It just was the name of the city. We don't have to allegorize everything and, and try to feel clever because I found connections that don't really have to be there for this to make sense. And, and here's the, the last thing I'll say about it because we're out of time. One of my problems with that whole, not just the seven letters, but the whole view that it's a part of, that the entire book of Revelation is about the end times. First of all, that's a misnomer because we're already in the last days. Did you know that? We were in the last days since Jesus came. People in the first century used that phrase for their time, the last days. So that's number one. But number two, if, if chapter four forward is all about what's going to happen at the very end of things, a lot of it won't make sense to you. It'll actually be ridiculous. When we're going to look at this. How many times can all the stars fall out of the sky? How many times can all the islands be pushed out of the way and disappear? How many times? And you're going to see the same thing happen multiple times throughout the Revelation that certainly couldn't happen more than one time. And you're stuck feeling confused, which most people are anyway by Revelation, but also thinking, this can't be true. The way that I'm being told to read this does not compute at all, because how many, how many times is God going to re put the stars in to make them fall down again? So the whole thing just has holes in it, and this is just one of the examples. We're really trying to suck out of the book of Revelation things that don't need to be sucked out of there, because what is there is amazing. Like why distract ourselves from the real message if the real message is so mm, good? And so uh, I've said it several times. I'll say it again. Our, I'm hoping your goal is with me is not to figure out how it's all going to happen in detail. I hope your goal with me is to find out what is Jesus saying to his church in this book for now? What do we do with that? Just like what did the first century disciples do with it? Because if all this is, is talking about what's going to happen later that you have no control over, now what? But if there's a message in this thing all the way through that's going to spur you on to the life you're meant to live, I'm all for it. Let's do it. So. <laughs> but read through it. I, I don't want to, I kind of showed you my cards beforehand, but I, I don't want to make you not interested in this. Read through it. See if it makes sense to you. And if you if you think there's more to it than I'm saying, please, let's talk it up. I want to, I want to know if it's true just like you do. All right. Okay, future rulers. <laughs> on with our training. Let's be faithful to the true king. And he will give us great favor in the days to come. Huh? It's very exciting. I'm not one to encourage people to think highly of themselves. So I'm not, I'm not trying to do that when I say this. I want you to think more highly of your role than you than I do. That requires humility, of course. So that's why I don't want you to think highly of yourself. But think more highly of your calling and your role than you might. Because, you, you know, when we talk to each other, we're like, well, I'm here. You know, and I get it. I, I feel that way a lot of days, too. But when we communicate to each other, the best we can do is just make it through the day. I think we're just not acknowledging who we're called to be. This is big. We're in war, and we're on the winning side. So let's do this thing. That kind of... Um, joy and anticipation is so much better than, well, I'm still here. Yeah, let's, let's see what we're going to do. And I think that that is the calling of Jesus. I really yeah. do. And uh, again, I don't criticize or blame anyone for that. I just say we've got more than that than we have. So.